So, Sean Ritter, how's it going, mate? I, I, it's all good, mate. It's all good. I can't, you know what? I don't mind just start putting my feet up for a while and watching uh, Netflix and, and Amazon Prime and uh, everything else that I can watch. I just sit there for a while and watch telly. I can, I can quite handle a few months of that. So is there anything in particular you've been watching on Netflix that's... You know, oh, man, you know, pretty much, uh, pretty much like uh, everything, really, you know. I'm not, I'm not good with the names, but you know the one about um, interviewing the serial killers in the 1970s and late 60s? Have you seen that one? No. Where it's sort, of, it's sort of setting it up for, I mean, you know, setting it up for uh, the words, the, the sort of name serial killer. You know, an interview in Manson. I mean, it's all real, you know. It's all based on real stuff. Uh, that and uh, the, the, I do travel. I've done travellers about these uh, dudes from the future who uh, inhabit people's uh, consciousness. I've done the Tiger King. Anyone who, uh, anyone who's, <laughs> all them animal people are all fucking raving mad. Yeah. All of them. Off the box, really? Have you seen that one? That side uh, of the thing? It's nuts. Apparently, uh, they're making a movie with Nicolas Cage. Apparently, are they? Yeah, with Joe, he's playing Joe Exotic. Right. Well, yeah, I can see that actually. I you know what's the big one? I just watched the other night. You might like White Lines. White Lines. Uh, White Lines. Of, yeah, it's. I've, I'm, I've, I've started watching it. It's. Uh, I see. It. That's it. It's the uh, the Coke thing in Ibiza. Yeah. Yeah, with all the English actors in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I've started watching it. Yeah, it's good. I've got a few on the go at once. You know, I'll do like three or four of like White Lines and then do three or four of something else. No, White Lines is good. I finished it the other night. Really enjoyed it. So, so how have you been coping apart from that during the lockdown? How's the family been? Is the family safe? Yeah, the family's great. I mean, it's, do you know what? It really has got really busy. I mean, you know, I get, uh, you know, at least five or six, seven, maybe more requests a day to, you know, get involved in, uh, in, in to something, you know, I mean, I, I you know, charity and, and the, uh, the health workers and all that lot. I mean, we did the Hacienda one, you know, I mean, that went really well. That got, that raised a lot of money. I mean, so, you know, there's a few of them sort of things on the go, but I mean, I, I, I if I was doing them all that I get asked to do, uh, I'd be doing them for about the, you know, sat here for the next three years without moving. What about the rest of the band, the Mondays and stuff? Have you heard, have you been keeping in touch with the likes of Bez and Rod? Ra- Ra- well, Bez, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, me and Bez are just about to film uh, Gogglebox. You know, because we can film Gogglebox, Bez has got a special license to, to come up to my place. Uh, and then we have all the gear that's camped out in the house, you see. It has to be... Uh, all the stuff has to be, uh, you know, wiped down with, uh, you know, it has to be disinfected and, and all that lot, you know. Uh, and that has to live in the house, you know, with cameras and stuff. Uh, and then they, uh, they film it, well, it's all robotically done and then they've got an outside broadcast fan that they, you know, they've sort of put the wires in, put the stuff in through the windows. So we're just about to, to do that, me and him. But well, I, I don't, so, uh, you know, I mean, I don't keep in touch with the rest of the band. <laughs> I mean, Dan's great. Uh, you know, Dan, our, uh, our main guy, who does the, the music director, you know. But, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't keep in touch with our kid. Only when we go to work. Well, it's, it's been uh, 30 years since Pills and Thrills and Belly X was, was released uh, in November 1990. Yeah, I think it's one of my top ten albums. I mean, why do you think it stood the test of time? Uh, I, I, I don't really know, Matt. You know, I mean, it's a good album. Uh, it still sounds. I mean, it's like to me, you know. I mean, it's like you put, uh, you know, a lot of music sounds timeless. You know, you can put, you know, Beatles albums on, Stones albums, you know, uh, Joy Division albums, New Order albums, any you know, Orange Juice albums, Motown albums, and they still sound timeless, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, suppose, you know, good music sounds timeless. And the biggest hit 
off the album was Step On. Um, is, is it true that uh, it, was, it was a cover version of the John Congo's track? Is it, yeah. Is it true that you don't get any publishing from that at all? No, I don't get anything for that. No. No, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, he's, it's either Congress and his people, uh, you know, they're really, let's, uh, let's say they're like absolutely fucking mean. I mean, McGee, I think McGee asked him after like, you know, 25 years of it, uh, you know, oh, give it, give, uh, give Sean 1% uh, for that bit of writing. Uh, and uh, then totally refused. <laughs> Never mind. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, another track on the album, Dennis and Lewis. I don't know whether you're aware of this, um, but it was obviously named after the couple who uh, followed you around uh, in New York on tour. Have you seen the movie? No, no the documentary, no. I mean, I, Dennis and Lois, I mean, you know, we met, I mean, we've stayed in touch with Dennis and Lois since we first met him in 86, 87 in New York, you know. I mean, we, you know, we was the first sort of the Manchester bands that... Uh, They'd met, you know, and we, and then, uh, you know, every, every, everybody sort of, uh, I mean, they're real big fans of Manchester music, you know, so everybody knows them and, and you know, who's Dennis and Lois, but I've not seen a documentary yet, no. Have you? Yeah, yeah, you're in it. Yeah, yeah. What's it on? What's, what's it, what's it go out on Vivo? Um, I've seen it on iTunes. On iTunes, oh, okay, I've got iTunes, I'll go and have a look. It's a good I mean, it was, I've seen them, the, the Mondays tour and the Black Grape tour that we just finished. It was on, uh, it came around on to a lot of shows on both of them just recently, so, you know, it only has been a few months since I've seen them. So what's the situation with the Mondays at the minute? Are you on hiatus? Yeah, the, I mean, basically, 20, there they should have been a few shows in 2020 just uh just uh, festival stuff you know and then that was it then it was a year two years off but because of what's happened so all the 2020 shows now have gone to 2021 so when they're done you know it's two years away from uh from the mondays because i want to go and push black great you know, I mean, we did a great album in 2017. We did a few shows on it, mainly, well, all in the, in the UK. You know, so, uh, you know, I want to go and do another uh, Black Grape album and uh, then go and spend uh, two or three years push, pushing uh, Black Grape around the planet. And who's, have, you, have you written any songs for it yet? For the new album? Yeah. I'm going to cut, I mean, me and Ollie are in our studio here, so, we, you know, we just, I mean, I've not seen Kermit since uh, the start of uh, the start of the lockdown thing, but, you know, I've got a few beats going, so, uh, and I'm always, like, I've got, you know, I'm always, I don't sort of go, right, it's time to write a song and, and sit down, I've never done that, I mean, I'm walking around, I get ideas in my head, and I'll either, you know, sing it, just so I've got a tune kept in my head, you know, down the phone or, you know, and write bits of lyrics on all sorts of scraps of paper and put them in a big teapot, really, which I've got here. And uh, I just get them out when I've got some tunes to go. I'm always writing, you know, for, you know, maybe before the Mondays or vice versa get swapped over, but usually it's, uh, that is for Black Grape and it stays with Black Grape. And it's also 25 years since uh, the Black, the debut Black Grip album was released, which, which was actually more successful than any Mondays record, isn't that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Mondays didn't have a number one album. We had number two. Uh, so the first Black Grape album went to number one, uh, which was really good. And in fact, the, the, the last Black Grape album that we released in 2017 got to number 15. So I think that that did better than the uh, the second Black Grape album, I think. Yeah. And who who's going to be working on the new album with, alongside uh, you and Kermit? Who's producing the Be Youth this time? Don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously uh, I would like uh, Youth to uh, be involved on a few tracks. You know, I, I think he's uh, brilliant. I love working with him. I mean, that's what the thing about Black Grape is. It really is me and Kermit. You know, I mean, still with the Mondays now. You know, everybody's got a say in, in everything. Uh, and, and with the Black Grape, it's just me and him, so it's a lot easier.
you know, if, if we want to do a Black Grape album, we just go, let's go and do a Black Grape album. If you want to do a Mundy's album, it always has been tricky and it always will be tricky. And can you foresee any shows, any live shows at all, not just yourselves? Uh, can you see any live shows being performed this year? I really can't, no. I mean, I think, uh, I think the Q&As will go ahead, but uh, I can't see... I mean, maybe, you know, maybe there might be a few live shows, you know, you know, for baby bands or whatever, you know, and a few hundred people and space them out, you know. Uh, but I can't see any, I really can't, not this year. I just think everything's pretty much gone in, uh, you know, in 2020 in, uh, in my game. Yeah, I agree. And you, the, the evening with Sean Redder, uh, Q and A's you were doing, you, you were doing them before the lockdown, yeah. And some afterwards. Um, what what does those shows entail? Basically, uh, me turning up and uh, you know getting uh, interviewed, or you know having a chat with whoever's uh, chatting to me. I mean, the thing about that is as well, I get it's great because I get a different guy every night talking to me. So it's always different, you know, I mean, you know, everybody's sort of style who's interviewing you or talking to you is always different. So, you know, if I went around with the same, you know, guy every night, it would, it might be a lot easier, but it'd be uh, really boring uh, and, and do me edit, you know, so I've got, to, I mean, it's like when I get there and I don't, you know, I, I purposely stay away from who's ever chatting to me. You know, I might do a quick eye on I, you know, if I know him or I don't know him, it's just, you know, I, how's things? And then, I, you know, I'm, I'm gone till we go on stage. So it's a real, you know, surprise. And then, you know, you can ask me, we talk to me, whatever you want to talk about. You know, I mean, it's funny, really, because my sort of, uh, my audience, my sort of, uh, you know, my punters are really weird because it's a wide range. You know, I mean, we've got, you know, Guardian sort of type people that was all at university back in the day. You've got your like your football league and sun readers. You know, you, you uh, you've got like loads and loads of people that we, you know, older people and younger. You know, uh, that we picked up off uh, television. You know, through doing TV shows. You know, like the Jungle and you know, 100 years younger and, you know, another one I did in, uh, in the Amazon jungle. You know, you've got all sort of, you know, I mean, that age group goes from like uh, 10 to 80. You know, so it's a real wide range of people. I mean, obviously, it's, it's most of the Q&As are over 18. So, you know, really, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about and, uh, you know, and, and use whatever language you want. <laughs> no, hopefully you'll come to Belfast at some stage. That would be. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not, we've done Dublin, you know, and uh, that was the, the next thing. That was what we were setting up to do, uh, you know, a, a, a tour of Ireland, uh, north and south. That's what the, the next move was, and then uh, and all this happened. So we didn't. It just didn't. Uh, we didn't carry on with it. Uh, setting it up. Well, the last time I spoke to you in Belfast. It was quite a few years ago. I think it was the last Black Grape album. You mentioned your solo album, which still hasn't seen the light of day. With Sonny Levine. It's coming out. It should yeah. have been out. That album should have been released. Uh, something like the, the first time, you know, the first week in June. It was all set up to go. It was coming out. But then this happened and we had to close it. Alan closed it down again. Right. Because, you know, we, we're doing, uh, it's coming out on uh, vinyl. There's so many vinyls and, and stuff. So they had all that set up. And, uh, yeah, so it, it will be out hopefully by the end of this year. And does it have a title? It's got a working title. Uh, I think it's something like, it's, it's got a mad work, a real sort of uh, take the piss working title like Artie, like something like work visits from future technology, right? <laughs> something arty, you know what I mean? Which it, it, it fucking isn't. <laughs> so we we'll give it something like that. It sounds like it should have been made by Gary Newman or something, yeah. or or, or, uh, or Ultra Box. 
And what does it sound like? Is it anything like your first solo album, which was very experimental? I'm not sure. No, 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 absolutely nothing like that. That was that first uh, that first sort of album. I mean, that, you know, I was in that much of a state then. I didn't even realise I was recording an album. You know, I'd gone. I'd gone to Australia, really, to, uh, you know, to do uh, a detox. Uh, I think I was there for about nine months. You know, I well overstayed me at Visa and everything. Um, uh, so, and then just to get my brain going a bit, I tried to do something. Our Pete said, why don't you just record a flow of all sorts, what's coming out of your streams of consciousness, you know, just for something to do. So, uh, I mean... And, and, who was it who did all the music with? Uh, oh, great guys, anyway. I mean, you know, Nate, but uh, yeah, I think it, it's uh, certainly a stream of consciousness that was just coming out on that one. Yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, I get things now like, hey, it's like, uh, oh, what they called, oh, shit, my name's, uh, oh, what they called, one of the, oh, some, oh, can't remember one of these uh, new he's not Cleveland mods or something yes yeah I get, you know, oh, okay. it's like Cleveland mods you know in there uh, right okay but yeah it's nothing like that nothing like that it's a good album still a good album yeah it's, you know look there's, there's some great music on it yeah. uh, it just shows that I really just couldn't really my mind was just blown you know I think I've been at it non-stop from 1981, and that was about 2000. So, you know, I've been at it for quite a long time non-stop, and I was completely fucking frazzled. Yeah, and so I was that frazzled, I just couldn't even get anything out of me frazzle. <laughs> <laughs> so it's now in there. <laughs> what, have you any other musical projects in the pipeline? Well, the new Black Great one. Yep. Yeah, not, not Monday's one. Uh, we'll do a Monday's album one day. Uh, it's got to be done my way. Uh, if it's not done my way, it won't be done. Well, if it's done your way, would it have Paul Hogan for producing? Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, they've definitely do, done some tracks with old kit, yeah. Also, uh... Your movie was in the process of being made. Oh yeah, yeah. We we had that that we, that should have already been started. Uh, should have started months ago. That and then obviously that had to get canned. I've just been told, given a rough date of when we are going to start on that, and it will be this year, so at the end of the year. So I can't wait for that. I was actually speaking to Jack the other night, and uh, he's uh, he's all ready to go. That's Jack O'Connell. He's playing yourself, isn't that correct? Yeah, he's playing me, yeah. yeah. He's great. Is, is it going to be a step up from, from the uh, Sean Ryder was seen in uh, 24 Hour People? 24 no. Hour People? No, no. I mean, look, I always say it about 24 Hour People, right? If I was just a normal punt, I, I'd find it a really funny film, which, you know, it is. It's a funny film. It's a comedy. The Sean Ryder in that and the Tony Wilson in that are the caricatures. You know, the young kid that, you know, was wrote about in The Enemy or the caricature of Sean Ryder at that age, uh, you know, it, it was, we was a cartoon band, all of us. You know, I've been saying this since we were kids. We, 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 it was like we'd lived in a cartoon. All our characters was like a cartoon. Uh, just, a, you know, a bunch of young Kids, all of us with learning difficulties. I mean, uh, having everybody in the Mondays, if we're to be back in school today, we would all be classed as kids with learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. uh, ADHD. You know. So, I mean, uh, and what they did in 24 Hour Party People, the movie, was just do the caricatures. And like I say, it's a funny film, but, you know, it's not really like that. Uh, you know, so this again, it's not just going to be a movie about, you know, taking loads of drugs and, you know, going from like, hey, let's go to Barbados and do the cocaine adventure and film that. Uh, let's go there and do that one. You know, that talks about story and, and that, like 24 hour party people start doing. It's not, you know, really it is about 
a young kid with ADHD, uh, you know, learning difficulties and that, who really couldn't do uh, anything, uh, you know, except set fires and uh, get pissed and take drugs, uh, you know, and, and want to be in a band. Uh, you know, I couldn't even, re I really couldn't do jobs. I mean, I, I, I mean, I got in the post office as a messenger boy because, well, my dad was a postman, but my granddad uh, went out drinking with the head postmaster at Manchester. You know, I couldn't even pass the test to get in the post office. I didn't pass it, but I got in. And the fact was, I could read. So as long as you could read, and then you learn on on the job. But I I just couldn't do the uh, test or anything. So uh, you know, uh, and then once you get in, I just can't you know I can't toe the line and do normal things. You know, I I would be just off. You know, when you know concentrate on that, and I wasn't able to concentrate on that. I was off there and off there. You know, whatever, jumping out of windows and <laughs> shit. So uh, yeah. So really, it's you know about kid with learning difficulties, and it's also a sort of a love story as well because my missus who I met when you know we, she was seventeen in this in the hacienda, you know I met her then, uh, and then we stayed in the same circle because her best mate married my best mate, uh, and then they was also friends with Bessie's missus, uh, so we all stayed in this same clan for years and years, and then my missus, when I got older, sort of, she blew me out, actually. She did blow me out uh, when we was young. Uh, and then, like I say, we all stayed in the same circle, and then when I got older and more responsible, uh, she uh, you know, wound me in. So it's really sort of a love story and a story, you know, about what I've just mentioned. Yeah, sounds good, looking forward to seeing I mean, Yeah, you know, the, the sort of, you know, the rock and roll, let's take drugs thing and, and all that has been done so many times in movies, hasn't it? You know what I mean? And if you want to get a movie made now, you've got to go a different angle. Yeah, yeah. But there isn't many stories as mad as the Happy Mondays rock and roll stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I always said, you know, I mean, I mean, we never kept quiet about it. I'm sure Fleetwood Mac and a lot of other bands, you know, whether it was Duran Duran or what, you know, or, you know, they all had mad rocky roll uh, stories and, and lives, but, you know, we just told everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? A lot of people talk about that there when, when you know about the Mondays, but you know people forget the Mondays you're really really hard working band especially in the early days isn't that correct oh yeah absolutely hard working i mean the one thing that we could all do was go in our rehearsal room our little studio you know and spend weeks in there without coming out you know just you know writing tunes making music you know experimenting you know i mean you know None of us minded lockdown, you know, we just bury our heads in the music and creating it and, and that's what we did, you know, we, we didn't really have any money to do anything else. So, uh, yeah. And what of our rockers in our, in our re rehearsal rooms. One of the studios the band recorded in um, back in the day was Power Street Studios in Liverpool and there's talk, uh, what, do you th what do you think about that? They're talking about closing it down and turning it into apartments? Right, uh, it's always sad when a, a studio gets closed down and turned into apartments. The thing is now, you don't really need those studios that you used to need. You know, everyone's got the tech that they can put in basically in their hand. You know, uh, and and the, the you know the spending hundreds of thousands of pounds in residentials has, has well gone out of the, the window. Uh, one, the record companies don't really give you the money for that anymore, and, and and it's not needed. You know, you can make great albums in your in your bedroom. Yeah. You know, because of the tech now. I mean, it is sad. You know, I mean, you know, we enjoyed uh, our that time in residential studios, uh, wasting hundreds of thousands of pounds <laughs> that we paid the bill for. You know, we did enjoy it. I mean, it's sad when any studio closes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just last one before I go. Um, 
you're a big UFO fan. Recently, uh, the, the, the Pentagon has issued footage of UFOs um, to the public. Yeah, well, look at that team. Look at that team that's come out now on... Uh, oh, I don't know. You can watch it on Amazon. There's a team. It's the guy who was the head of uh, something at the... Uh, you know, the CIA, another guy who was the head of the military and Navy, you know, all high-ranking guys that's still involved in it, that are there, telling you what's what, telling you that, you know, these things. It, it makes me pissed, though, when you get, well, some of them going, well, you know, we should, how frightening is it, you know, because uh, it's uh, the defence and, and, and we're going to get, you know, invasion and these things. And it's like, well, you know, You've got stuff there that, you know, you're talking about from the 90s. You know, stuff that went on in the 60s. We're going to, going to fucking start war with us or invade us. You know, I mean, they, they've got to be the slowest, laziest motherfuckers on the planet, on any planet, haven't they? You know, I mean, it's took them years and years and, and you know, without uh, turning us into robot slaves. So they're certainly not here to, uh, you know, to do any harm. And you know, I mean, you know, my... My thing is that these things was here before us. Any bases on the moon have been on the moon way before us. No, how do you know? You don't know that they didn't, you know, genetically alter us and stayed here, you know, looking and watching what's going on. You know, they was, who says it's our planet? Who says that's our moon? The people that are on it have, like I say, been way before we are. Well, Sean, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much for taking the time out. Thank you. Thanks for having me.